what, what cilantro and see the bugs. Yeah, you can just see like there's a serpent fly buzzing around, you know, um, and it's just good. you're going to see that everywhere. And oh, the other thing I didn't mention about cilantro, the chefs love. We don't have it on this one, but we'll see it in the garden, right? They love the seeds when they're green. The green coriander, you can get a nice price. And once again, I wouldn't pick them. I'd cut the whole thing. Wait till there's a bunch of seeds on, bring the whole thing in, you know? And they just love it because it's going to give the flavor of coriander, which works wonderfully in, cor in curries, but it's going to be way more aromatic than the dry coriander. So it's a, you know, I had to get taught that by a chef. He said, can I get this seed? It's like, yeah. And it's like, this is going to be spectacular. It's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, okay, let's keep going. Let's see if there's anybody on this one here, though. Well, not as much. We want to actually get out to where it's a little warmer. So this is a little high up here too. It's not as not an ideal habitat. Um, if you're ever up on the roof of an apartment building, you won't see as many insects. You know? So here's the wild, you know, and we're going to see in the wild things that provide beneficial insects. The wild lettuce provides beneficial insects. It also is one of my least favorite weeds. Likewise, the vetch is a wonderful food source for beneficial insects. Never let it near your garden or your farm. It's impossibly hard to get rid of. It's got the medusa effect like comfrey or horseradish. You cut it, pull it up, and every little piece that breaks off regrows. So it's fine to have it here, but you don't want to let it get out. If you see it coming up in a bed, pull it out. You know? What kind of vetch is that? Crown vetch. Crown vetch. Yeah. They, they sell that for highways. They sell it for highways. And I learned the hard way. If I'm consulting and I tell somebody to grow vetch, Great. Not to say don't grow crown vetch, because what will they remember? Crown vetch. Crown vetch you know, <laughs> say only grow hairy vetch. Right. You know, never use the word crown vetch because we had it seeded at, at Mountaineer. It took me three years to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, over here we have mint. I just harvested a bunch. It's going to be in flower. It's definitely wild. We don't want it, but it feeds the beneficials in a big way. You know. Um, as we come along, they're finishing up now. And I talked about letting plants finish their cycle. And this is celery. And it's the flowers are kind of finishing up now too, but it is, when it's in full bloom and in its prime, it's one of those plants that's just totally a buzz. You, know? you let one or two celery go to seed. If it's open pollinated, it's very easy to save the seed. It comes true if you don't have other celery around. And meanwhile, it's feeding the beneficials like crazy. And most years we get loads of volunteers, you know, which we can then plant out. One of my um, favorite things to do is grow celery that I plant sometime in late August and harvest between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And it's the best celery you'll ever have. It is so sweet and juicy and low fiber. So this used to be an herb bed. Maybe we'll get it back. And I'm looking for the marshmallow and Unfortunately, we haven't caught the, the main concentration. Some of them have moved on, but you can see that there's some concentration. Does anybody not know the kudzu bug? Is it, is it over there too? It's yeah, like a little yeah. brown, pointy. Little brown shielded yeah, bug. Yeah, kind of bronzy. I'll cut it off a piece and show you. Um, and so this is where we're going to come and we're going to spray it big time with spinosa to knock these populations back. And we're a little bit behind. We should, I should have done it yesterday. Most of them fell off to get away. That's a habit of those guys. But anybody that doesn't know them, and that's on, it's attracted to marshmallows. So it's a... it's it likes marshmallow figs, mm. um, and those are great trap crops. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's good to have that kind of stuff. You want them to show up. Does everybody know Debbie Roos growing small farms? I should really have that resource on. She has a list of the things that they like to jump on. You know, yeah. Spinosad solves this pretty easily. Spray a few times. Let them concentrate, come in and wipe them out, you know. It's the same strategy for harlequin bugs. Scout out, catch where they're concentrating early in the season. Both harlequin bugs may, may be hit by spinosa too. We just heard that spinosa worked for this, that's what we used. For harlequin bugs, we use a 20% stronger than normal formula. And within a few days, they're dead. Now, it's kind of weird because you'll spray it and don't think it works because it doesn't work immediately. And by the way, both spinosad and um, the soap are not my favorite things to spray because they do hurt some beneficials too. But with this kind of outbreak kind of thing, you got to kind of do it. You know, you don't want these to get away from you. Okay. Um, 
All right, let's take a look in the greenhouse. See what we can see. I know we'll find some aphid infestations. Um, I saw my first squash beetle today. Oh. Uh, we want to look and see if we can find um, the eggs for those. Because if we find, and there's a surface fly coming in and landed, it'll lay its eggs. And those guys will possibly eat squash beetle eggs, but they'll definitely eat aphids. Talking about stink bugs? Um, no, squash beetles. It's the one that looks like a bean beetle, but it's bigger. Oh. You know? It's, it's like a big bean beetle. Here's your sea bag. You got sea, okay, three people over and show them the sea bag. And the problem with showing it is it's moving so, it's moving so much, right? Well, this one's not. It's oh, good. Sleeping. It's, it's, you know, you say fuchsia with maybe seven black spots, and shaped like a cucumber yep, yep. Is that also one right there? No, that is great. That is ladybug um, pupa. That's what people killed because they thought it was potato beetle pupa, potato beetle larva. I mean, obviously this is just a reaction of I got to kill the problems. Because if you look at that, it does not look like a potato beetle larva. Right. You know? But it looks more like a potato beetle larva than anything else. And if it looks like it might be, kill it, right? Because that's the solution. You know? The key is it's attached. You know? It's, it's a pupa. It is not a larva. You know? Um, and the other, we have another greenhouse over on Grandview. I mean, these things are on concrete walls. These things are everywhere. There are so many ladybug pupa, it's incredible. So we were noticing that our have a tremendous number of ladybug larvae this year. Good. Tremendous, way, you know, five times. A, and you've been working on farmscaping, right? Well, not really, but we let some stuff go. And let some stuff go, put some flowers in. You grow flowers, flowers anyways for money, right? But I think it also might be just a cycle, as you were saying, that, you know, not to take credit for it, but it yeah, might just it could be, be happening. It could be. See, I take credit for it for us because I know we're feeding. You know? Uh -huh. I know for years. I mean, years ago we gave a talk at Highland Lake Inn. We walked into a greenhouse. There were so many ladybugs. They were laying their eggs on the wall of the greenhouse and they were eating their own eggs. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, you know, I take credit. But maybe part of the scene for this year is that. You know? Yeah, who knows? I mean, we shouldn't take credit for anything. Well, what about <laughs> uh, regular ladybugs? Um, they eat aphids. That's what they're known for eating. They eat what eggs of all kinds of other insects. Okay. Basically, we never do anything about potato beetle. I'm going to show you pictures because between the ladybugs, okay. the ground beetles, I mean, basically, the early stages of potato beetles, if there's right. enough of them, you ramp up. But there's another thing that feeds the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can just hand pick the potato beetle larvae when they get really big. Yeah, when they're really a huge problem, you might. But, I mean, I do now because what I say for like zits, I can't not do it. You know? But I don't really need to. And actually, I'll show you a picture, an example. I mean, I found this one great shot of predation. And I was, what I, I found it because I was hitting, even though I should have been getting ready for market, I had a, one plant that was heavily infested, it must have been weaker, mm -hmm. and I could not pick them. Right. And as I was doing it, I saw that there was a um, spine soldier bug sucking the juice out of a um, ladybug larva. I had to go home and get the picture. I then left for market, came back, I left all the rest of the larva on there because I took way too long to do that, and there must have been 15 or 20 larvae on that plant. By the next day, there were no potato beetle larvae. Between the various predators it had been cleaned up. You know? So the time I took was totally wasted. I didn't need to take it. You know? um, so keep looking, see what else we see. Great eyes though, guys. That is a damselfly. I show that to people. That's a beneficial for sure. It's a predator. A damselfly. And um, it, it preys on, on insects, small insects. It's a Predator. whole lot of things. That's why I, I'm trying to get people to create diversity. Because there are some things that are key, like CMAC, like a Pennsylvania soldier Predator. beetle, you know, that are major predators, trichogramma wasp, the conid wasp. A lot of them, they just range so far and eat such a huge array of insects that they're never going to be your key control, but they're a piece of that fabric of control. Just that incredible balance that means things never get out of whack. You know? Another example. I'm walking through my field and I'm going to show you a picture. Lots of years, though, not the last few years, I don't know why, but lots of years, goldenrod gets a heavy outbreak of red aphids, the goldenrod aphid on the tips of it in the springtime. Never hurts the goldenrod, but every predator in the world feeds on it, including one time one of my interns looked and said, what's that? What's that bumblebee doing on the aphids? It wasn't a bumblebee, it was a robber fly. Robber flies are huge, and they'll do things like grab a squash beetle, or a bean beetle, or a Japanese beetle, but they're not going to mess with aphids, they're too small. But if they can have corn on the cob in, in effect of aphids, they're going to be their feeder. You know? 
So you never know what the control is going to be. And every piece is part of the control. Keep looking a little bit and then we can move on. Here, by the way, if you don't know it, is the one that got by us because we didn't remember to start spraying soon enough. There's another, that's another ladybug pupa, right? More of the same, okay? Um, this is the damage of a vine borer. Does anybody not have vine borer problems on their squash? Not yet. Yeah. But do you have them every year? Yeah. These are not, not bad. Good for you. We have the other things get them. Uh huh? What do you got? Yeah, it is. Yeah, this one's obviously toast, but that is a Pennsylvania soldier bee. Yeah. yeah. Is this white modeling anything other than normal? It's genetics. That's all it is. Yeah. And indeed, I taught a class with Tom Butzler. He used to be a pathologist in Bunker County, and his point in that class was know your plant because he got called out by a farmer one time with just started growing zucchini from from tobacco right. because of that, you know. And so then we walked out. And I looked at um, some mosh that had curling leaves, and I said, yeah, I should see what's going on with that. And then John Rowland reminded me that they, they sell a mosh that has leaves that curl and call it cupping so it can collect the dressing. Right. So I just helped teach it and then didn't practice it myself. Yeah. This, red spider that's set up in the cup of the... And that's, spi all spiders are beneficial, of course. They're a huge piece. It really is about the fabric, of course, so having the spiders are another piece of that fabric of control. Yeah. Um, ants, by the way, nothing's black or white. That's we, we, I, don't know if I, I might not have covered that in the outline. My favorite example is I'm at Gaia Herb Farm, and I've learned thrips because I worked at, Mount, at High Old Lake where they used edible flowers, and we'd get thrips in the flowers, and then once we knew we had them, before we knew we had them, we served them to people and they ate them, and it didn't matter. So small, right? Just a little more protein. But once we learned, of course, we had to do something about it. So we got Aureus and Sidiosis and the new pirate plug, and it solved the problem. But then I learned enough to spot thrips. And I'm at Gaia Herb Farm, and they're growing St. John's wort for the flowers. And of course, the flowers are covered in thrips. Covered in thrips. So I go to Everly, the farm manager, because I'm just a compost site manager. I'm not the farm manager. I say, Everly, you need to know you got thrips. And she's like, thrips? Oh no, what am I going to do? And she doesn't know a thing about it. She goes, goes over, grabs the Rodell Encyclopedia, looks up thrips. One of the things she reads is that they also feed on spider mites. So they're not good and they're not bad, right? We never know what the function of the insects are. That doesn't mean she doesn't have to control them, but she still has to avoid thinking thrips are purely bad. What's bad is things out of balance. Yeah, there's another one. I don't know what, what's bumping these guys off. It's not good. But I'm going to hope for the fact that there's still plenty more where they came from, you know? So I'm not going to worry about it. <clears throat> okay. Um, ants are also predators. You know, they will hurt aphids. They'll be a problem. But in China, they would stick bamboo from one tree to another to help the ants to move from one tree to another. Because they're happy to eat insects, too. You know? So we just have to understand that it's all about the balance. Keep going here. Great example here, Buckley from last year. We're happy to, if you can, try and walk in the path. If you step on the bed, I don't mind, but if you can walk in the path, it's all the better. Um, Buckwheat, you know, you can see the little insects flying around it. You know, that's from last year. We're happy to have it. Um, we tend to grow enough that we don't seed it out just to have it out there because it pops up anyways. But if you don't have it, I'd recommend scattering some seeds around. You know, it's not in the way. Here's an example of us, like, holding our fire and having to hold it and really hope that it works and I know it's working for other things but this guy's covered up with spider mites. We've released predators and we are getting control but some things are suffering more than others. If you look on the back side you will see the spider mites little webbing. If you got really good eyesight and you get new glasses you'll even see the little tiny mites. We released a whole bunch of predatory mites and if you look at the new growth we're starting to come out of the problem. You know, um, And believe me I've been very tempted to come in with something and nuke them because they've been really pretty tough. Um, that kind of damage is classic, you know, it has that kind of mottled look, um, kind of bleached out look from spider mite feeding. That plant's really been hit hard. Um, spider mites are really the worst in, the, um, in a hot, dry greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Cool and moist, not much problem, but hot, dry, serious problem. 
we release the predators in this greenhouse and in number number one, which we'll go to and look at. And remember, I said you have to have the yeah, you want to leave the wild around. Those wild habitats are going to always have a low level infestation of spider mites and a low level infestation of the predators. This is my theory. Talk to me next year. I'll let you know if I had to break down and do something. Mm -hmm. But there's a tool that I learned about from Dr. Richard McDonald about two years ago. And boy, we rely on it all the time now. And that is neem. Neem used as a drench. As a drench, it goes systemic. So I'm not hurting any insects that I don't want to hurt. But any insect that tries to feed on the plant won't feed on it because the neem makes the plant so bitter that nothing can eat it. So as a drench, I can come in if we were worried about this guy and drench this plant and the spider mites would stop feeding. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the predator doesn't feed on the plant so it's not hurt at all, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I don't know if it'll feed on any, any spider mite that was stupid enough to keep feeding, but precious few will and they'll feed on them. So it's a great way to control it without having to hurt your predators, you know? We dropped about 160 bucks on spider mite predators and I've wondered if it was working. I am thinking it's working now, but that's an example of being willing to hold your breath, you know? Um, and I don't know that we're gonna find the time to drive over to Grandview, the other, our other operation, but there is a perfect example because there's about five cucumbers that are breaking my heart. They just really never came out of the spider mite infestation, but everything else in the greenhouse is spectacular, even though you can look at any number of plants in, in any given row and see a very low level spider mite infestation. We don't really care. If it's not affecting the vigor, it's okay by us. You know? Some introduced predators have the ability to overwinter and build up populations over seasons, and some don't at all. Exactly. One time shot. Pediobius fobulatus is a perfect example. We looked at that and I said, I saw my first squash beetle. We got beans, we're gonna have bean beetles. We get them every year. Every year I say, I'm gonna take extraordinary measures. And next year, because we have heat in this big greenhouse at Grandview, I know I will, to grow beans early drive south, get the bean beetles, bring them up and infect my plants. Mm -hmm. So I can then release Pediobius fovulatus, which gives us complete control. We really don't have bean beetle and squash beetle problems anymore because we release those. Mm -hmm. But by the time I release them, it's gonna to be too late once they start making babies for me to then pass them on to you. Mm -hmm. But next year I hope to be able to say, I can get you like this many for $5 a mummy. Mm -hmm. Whereas you will drop more like $40 for four or five if you're shipping them because you're paying the overnight freight, mm -hmm. you know? And so then you'll have them. <coughs> that looks like the, um, the kudzu bug, I thought. It moved so fast they didn't see it. Okay, well then it's, it's another bug for sure. <laughs> now, if it's, um, we might be able to look close and see if we can tell too. Right. You can tell the bad guys from the good guys, quote, quote, even though I don't, I say there aren't bad guys and good guys, I still fall back into that because I'm human, you know? But um, the way you can tell it is the, the predatory bugs have a much more, much more armored proboscis, right? They all have this beak that they kind of stick underneath them when they're not feeding, and it comes out when they're feeding. And the plant feeding ones, it's a much less armored. It's not as big and as strong. They don't need to shove it into something that's trying to move and get away, and they don't have to get it in there firmly, inject something in there to kill the bug, and then suck it dry, you know? Um, and so that's how you can tell. If we look good, we might see one. You know? um, there's a bunch of them in here. We probably, actually I say that, we actually <coughs> good, we won't see one though. The reason is we don't have high levels of soft bodied insects in here right now. Once we start getting the bean beetle larva and the, um, potato, and the um, potato beetle larva, um, the squash beetle larva, then we're liable to see those guys. You know? That's probably the, um, broccoli, the broccoli butterfly. We walk along here, you can see that we have a, a le some level of um, flea beetle damage, but because our plants are big and healthy, it's not affecting them. We got them nice and big to start with, and it doesn't really matter that they're here, you know? Um, we also had pretty darn good control through putting beneficial nematodes out. Um, and we just did it again. We just had a, a perfect rain. We're hoping we're going to establish again this year. By fall of last year, we didn't have flea beetles really at all. Here's a bright orange, kind of like this absolute, but... That's the here. Definitely has a hardened proboscis. Yeah, that's definitely a 
Lisa, see if you can come up here and get a picture of this guy. Richard, can you tell us who it is? I can't tell you really, but I, it, it sure looks like a predator to me, too. By the way, everybody know assassin bugs? The really big ones? They're obviously predators. Richard can tell you, don't handle those. He got bit by one and it hurt for months. You know? I mean, that guy's just looking at you like, I'll take you on, you know? If it was a, if it was an herbivore, it'd be dropping to the ground, mm -hmm. you know. But this guy's like, you want to fight? I'm tough. It's def the bugs have that, you know. Usually it's more shield shaped, but it's always that kind of like not not oval, but more like geometric shape, you know. Um, and yeah, it's going to be interesting. We should be able to show Richard both video. If you get a good picture, Joe, will you send it? I get it up close, yeah. Okay, come on. You can do it. Back row. Yeah, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> where, where are we? Let's see. All right, we'll try it. Okay, cool. All right. Moving through pretty quickly. I think there's a better chance of seeing some more action outside, actually. Um, the greenhouses are pretty much in control. I mean, we're going to start to see the bean beetles pretty soon. Then we'll get the predator. But otherwise, we're just not having much insect pressure in here. Um, oh, you know what? We should have some good aphid pressure over on the last row of uh, tomatoes. Last row of tomatoes was a, a class we did. It's lasagna bed. And so there was some variation in nutrients because of the nature of the lasagna bed. And so we had a few nice aphid outbreaks. Let's see if we can find some aphid predators in there. Wow. We're throw that guy in our pasta tonight. Yay! I didn't know that we were getting these guys yet. Wow. While we pass the worm box, I'm going to put a concept out to you. We brew compost tea that has beneficial nematodes in it. And Brian Rosa, who's a, a, a worm box compost guy for the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, one of the things he did as a grower was he would take his compost tea and spray it on his worm boxes and thereby multiply the beneficials in the, in the worm box. I'm wondering if we can multiply the beneficial nematodes in the worm box. So I'm trying to get our sprayers to put it out every time. Ooh, that is a pretty one. I don't know who it is. Yeah, you know, It looks like a good guy to me, though. Um, he just has that look. Let's see if we can get Richard to tell us who that is, too. <laughs> the great thing is, Richard doesn't mind me sending these because a good picture goes up on his website, you know? take home messages that there's a gazillion bugs in here and if you start spraying you have no idea what you're after. That's exactly, that is the mess, that is the take home message. It's like, I mean, hold your fire. all these bugs that you don't know what they are. And right. Yeah. Can... If you get enough of them, you tend to get balance. Right. You know? mm -hmm. um, we have precious few bug problems except for those invasives. Mm -hmm. So this year, cutworms major, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a first, you know. Um, a first since I've been here, and we all attribute it to the fact that we've been doing more and more low-till, having more and more turf, and that's what the cutworms love, you know? So we're having to change our, and last, last fall, the vegetable weaver, you know? So now we have to learn what that rhythm is, what that system is, how we're going to deal with it. Um, did you get it good enough? Okay. Anybody else want to take a look at this little garland? It's absolutely gorgeous fun. I'm ready to pass it on if somebody wants it. No? Going once, going twice? Okay. Uh, let's go over here and see what we can find about the aphids. I don't think we can find much other questions. Here's a good example of another. Uh, I'm not sure who that was, but it's probably a bull. This was, and I always ask, by the way, here's more of the spider mite damage. Pretty significant. Plus, calendula is a wonderful composite for beneficial. See all the little bugs flying around? I can't tell you who they are, but I'm glad they're there. That, that plant has been hit really hard by spider mites. I don't really care. 
you know? I'm not really sure why it's still being hit, but I'm not going to come in and try and wipe the spider mites out if it's on one of my farmscaping plants. You know? But this plant here, you can see it was a huge radish. You know? And we could have easily pulled it, it would have been good food for the hungry, but the guys kind of like, sometimes I could tell they're going, okay, we got to leave that in for Pat. Other times they're totally into it, you know? Um, and lots of times they just do it on their own now and then they come in and see it, you know? But it just depends on their mood, whether or not they want to leave one in. We left this in and it made a huge array of flowers early on, fed the beneficials like crazy. I think these guys are too far along now, too tough, but you can have your radish flowers and then you can actually have radish pods for a fancy chef. You know, right now at, up at Hector's Farm, we just cut a whole bunch of radishes that were covered with pods and they're gonna be a specialty in the restaurant, you know? And you could also grow rat tail radish, one of the worst names for a vegetable I've ever heard, um, which you grow for the pods, but you get the beneficial flowers before the pods. And by the way, these flowers, feel free to try one. There's a, there's a nice one there. Tastes like radishes and they're edible. So you can use the flowers and the pods and you get the beneficial effect. You know? And you leave that radish in the ground and it's getting bigger and deeper and doing even more bioaccumulating, fractioning the soil even more. We had a whole row of them here. We left about four in the row. Finally, as the peppers went in, they only left this last one. You know? And it doesn't really matter now. It can come out anytime. It's about done. So, Patrick? Yes. So, I looked at some of these cucumbers and I found, you know, not very much, but then I found this little cucumber beetle on it. And I said, oh, I want to pinch him. But it, do I say no because things you know, are under I control? I, I still pinch it. There's more where they came from. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> what I don't want you to do is say, oh, there's that cucumber beetle. I'm going to get a spray. Yeah. and spray it because then there's a collateral damage, you know? Yes. You just can't throw things that far off and we do have to pop an occasional zip, you know? <laughs> that's, that's my metaphor for it, you know? Okay. Um, and this year I have killed very few. Other years I've killed quite a few, you know? It's not like we don't get them, we just don't get enough that it's a problem, you know? It has not been an issue for us at all. None of our seedlings are damaged, mm -hmm. you know? And I still can't tell you what's doing it because there's cycles in the soil and only last year is the first time that we got the nematodes working right. Mm -hmm. but we haven't had a problem with them forever. You know, the thing I know that controls them is bats. You know, um, mm -hmm. But I can't make any claims that we've done anything for bats at all except we'd be glad they're out there. You've got a stink mm -hmm. bug stuck in a sticky trap. Right, a sticky trap made by a spider. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, yeah, and that stink bug almost certainly looks like a railroad squash bug. When I bump into them, I crush them. You know? yeah. um, oh, I'd heard that you, the smell attracts more of them. You know, you crush them and you get that awful smell. It, that's some, probably true, you know that? Thanks for the tip, that's one more reason not to kill. What? <laughs> or put them in a soapy can of soapy water. Soapy water is something that, I'm that's not going to go back and get soapy water. No, no, soapy. I'm just saying that, it, I, I, yeah. Okay, but, but you know what, that leads to something I would have said anyways. If you don't, if you do have trouble with vine borers, yeah. I had trouble with vine borers and my solution used to be to grow a rotation of squash, right? To have a batch going, put another batch in, and I recommend that anyways because squash runs out of steam. But I did more rotations, more successions, because of the vine borer. I just accepted that they were going to be killed off, right? And then I read in Rotel, in Rotel Magazine that if I spray BT and soap at the base of every squash plant twice a week, every squash plant that's susceptible, by the way, butternut and Kushaw family are not susceptible. You don't have to worry about them. Their stems are too hard for the vine borer to attack them. But for the other ones, if I sow, if I spray twice a week with BT and soap, totally control it. The first year I did that, I had to wholesale squash. And when I was growing for market, I wasn't into wholesale. I wanted nothing but retail and CSA. But I had so much squash, my members couldn't possibly eat it because no squash plants died. So that's the solution to vine borers. It's really easy. BT and soap, two label, twice a week. Only, only got to hit the base. But where do the squash bugs hang out, right? You water them, they come up from the base, right? And get up on top of the plant to dry out. They're hanging out down there low too, and that soap at least hurts the adults and wipes out the nymphs. So the serendipitous effect of doing that spray is we have hardly any problem with squash bugs too. Are you talking about squash bugs or vine borers? Squash bugs and vine borers are controlled by the same routine. Okay. What do we have? What are you showing me? Squash bug right there. Right under that giant, they're all giant leaves, but right there. Okay. Does anybody need to see a squash bug? We all know that guy, right? Yeah. yeah. Hey, what's this? That's the kudzu bug again. Right, everybody see it? It's kind of bronzy, gray, you know. They really like the fig, too. We're going to spray the fig, too, you know. Um, they haven't been that bad on the beans yet, you know, but we're due, we're due to spray. I kind of let it go till 
after this class, so I wanted to show people. Um, okay, so now I have to hope. I'm actually hoping that, yes, we still have the aphid infestation. But it's totally isolated, so I don't really worry about it. It's just right here. It's both aphids and spider mites and white fly. Oh, my God. And you know what? It tends to be that way. If you have a weak plant, they tend to get everything. So I'm going to cut these off and see if you all see. You look for the gold balls. Look for ladybug larva. If you see a winged insect, it's probably... You know what? What I'm seeing is there's not really any remaining insect life. Whatever was here is kind of finishing its cycle. I don't know that we're going to see anything here. Let's look at a bigger leaf here and see what we can see. Yeah, this has been really infested and it looks like it's damaged from it. But this outbreak has kind of already run its cycle. It's not really a problem anymore. Yes, yeah, that's Pennsylvania soldier beetle. Yep. If you want to see one that's not dead, folks. Yeah. Yep. They're mating. Yep. Yeah. That's what they do. You can count on it. You know, they're as reliable as can be. So I was hoping to find some some aphids or some um, surface fly larva or something. I actually brought surface fly larva from that side over to here when I found them after I got a picture. That one you saw the picture of got moved from over there to this plant. And whatever is doing it, this is controlled. There's a bad infestation here. It looks like crap. By the time you get up here, no problem. By the way, these are sun golds. They are particularly susceptible to everything. They're particularly spectacular. I can't not grow them, but they get disease faster. They get insects faster than other things. You know? um, and probably because they're putting all, their, all that, you know, we bred them to put so much into the fruit and it, they're giving up other things to do that. Okay, here's this actually, there's much more life on this celery here. It's, it's, an old, it's a newer plant and the flowers are younger. So you see far more life, lots of little things buzzing around. That Pennsylvania soldier beetle, you know. Um, as we look through here, we might see other things. It's, yeah, and every Pennsylvania soldier beetle I see here, 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 they're always mating. They got the food. They don't waste any time, you know. <laughs> they go to it. They get they do the dinner and the rest of it at once, you know. There's no 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 ritual here. They just go right to it. Okay, here's dinner. Here's the mating. Let's get it done. You know. Um, and so you're getting that control. And just see all the little little tiny things flying around. They could easily be Baconid wasp. I can't tell you. I can't see that well, and I wouldn't be able to tell anyways. I do see the surfer fly. You know, it's going to be laying its eggs. It's, you're looking for that a buzz, you know. And frankly, it's not as a buzz as it could be, but it is It is that a buzz. We do have that light. You know? um, yeah. Have a question. Yeah. You got quite a bit of dock around. Yeah, and it's and no I've good. I've been digging it up religiously and putting it in trash bags to, for, because of the Ceratophora. Yep. I want to know if it's something I don't know. No, no, no. You're just more. You're, you're better than we are. Well, yours doesn't. <laughs> yours isn't infected the way ours is, though. Um, you know, this year's not been a bad year. It is some years. Yeah. And actually, if I am just walking the farm doing that kind of puttering thing, you'll see me yeah. cutting seed stalks off okay. everywhere. Because, like yeah. you said, let it go wild to take out the yeah. bad guys. And so, like, I have it's a vector. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I would, and you know. Alex and Vanessa, yeah. they had Gina Elrod, my boss at Mount Mary, in, in, their, in their CSA, mm -hmm. and then she was in mine, mm -hmm. and she loves beets, and she told them that I only had beets early and late. Mm -hmm. And they said, you can't grow beets? Why can't you grow beets? Mm -hmm. It's so easy to grow. And so I was at market, I said, so you guys have much to cost for? They said, what's that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Do you have much stock? No. But we were at uh, <laughs> Ivy Creek for the fact a couple of weeks ago, and the dock that we had there, Paul, Gallimore. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, there is really wet, wet, yeah. uh, abused soil, really soggy, springs coming up everywhere, mm -hmm. and the dock was insane. It was like, it was like lawn. They grass. loved that. It that was condition. horrible. Yeah. yeah. And it was just like mixed water. Was well, it covered up with Sacospora? Yeah. Completely. Yeah. I guarantee you, he's got Sacospora problems on his beach. Yeah. You know, I <laughs> mean, that's just, that goes, it goes with it. We, oh, but the other thing to know, which I, I told Cedar in the last class because we were covering diseases, this is one I have to share because it was revelatory to me. If you have trouble with disease on beets and trouble with beets, make sure you have the right boran, borac, borac, boron level in your soil. You know, Get it tested, see if it's right, or just do a little trial. Try some beets in a little patch that you do the proper amount of borac, boron, which is very little. As soon as we did that, we had much less to cost for the beets really cannot stand to be boron deficient and they're way weak if they are. 
you know. Our Sacasper problems have been greatly improved since we did that. You know? And our beats are just like a hundred times better than they were. Okay, let's move along. Let's we'll glance up through here a little bit more. Definitely got a few people with beetles, not worried about them. Like I just stepped here, and as I stepped here, the cloud of insects just came up. So I invite you to step towards the celery and see what flies up, you know? Um, there's definitely serpent flies flying up, you know? To see what happens. This celery is wonderful farmscaping, you know? This is a neglected bed, which will be pretty soon. We're probably going to lasagna bed it one more time. We've been lasagna bedding these beds because we're trying to raise them up because this is a wet area. We're also going to put a French drain in. So this bed's kind of just waiting on that. If you don't know lamb's quarters, this is the one I said is the home, the re nighttime resting place for um, Scoliodubia and also one of my absolute favorite greens. If you've never had lamb's quarters, does anybody know lamb's quarters here? I'm going to throw some in the, in the pasta tonight. You know that? It is just my way up there on my list of favorite greens. And I have taught a lot of farmers to bring it to market and sell it, you know. I sense that farmers come back to me and say, you're selling yours too cheap. It's like, it's just a weed. <laughs> but this one's on its way to go in the seed. Yeah, but the leaves will still be fine. Right, but the, no, no, then your ground will be covered with. No, we probably won't let it. But I'm going to get some, some of the pink ones in and let them go to seed. Uh -huh. You know, we probably will, we're, we're pretty close to, to weeding this all out and cleaning it up, uh -huh. you know. And indeed, most of that stuff will never get to germinate seed because we've got hot compost. Uh -huh. You know, always hot, guaranteed hot, you know, so we clean it all up, you know. For the longest time, nobody wanted to compost the weeds because they couldn't figure out how to get them to work in. They were hard to mix. And I said, right. we have to compost the weeds. Right. There is no way we don't compost. Not only because it's going to kill the seeds, but also because it is going to um, improve the quality of the concept, compost because there's all the minerals and stuff that are coming up in these. Mm -hmm. now, these guys are great bioaccumulators. Okay. We can see that down here we did have the spider mite damage. You know, it's not happening. Oh, here we have something. I love this. Those used to be aphids, and now they're the alien. That's all Braconid wasp mummies, you know? And obviously we have well-fed Braconid wasp because that, it was probably one wasp and she had a lot of eggs to lay, mm -hmm. you know? And so we get that control. <coughs> um, I showed over here, Pat, real quick, just turn it sure. this way. There we go. And then if you want to pan, there's even more right there. Yeah. You know? Wow. I mean, it's just there's there aren't really I don't think there's any viable aphids left. You know, that's one of the better concentrations I've seen. Can you get a still of that from that and send it to me? Yep. I want to put that one on my on my own thing. That's probably the usually it's <coughs> there's more aphids. It's not that concentrated. This these guys have been totaled. You know, the Wakanda wasps just didn't show any mercy. They used them all. You know, they're just all going to be. And if you get a good picture, send it to me too, if you would. You know? Yeah, definitely want to use that as an example. Um, I will, you know, <coughs> say that these guys are not as pretty as some. They're oftentimes way more golden. But it might be that you can see the hole where they've hatched out there. If you look real close, can you get that on the thing there? See that one's got the hole in it? You know, um, there's several that have hatched out. These guys are already out flying and doing the next the next round. You know, um, and indeed, if these hadn't been hit so hard. This level of aphids could easily also have a surface fly larva, mm -hmm. like that last one, you know, or a ladybug larva, you know, um, or a ladybug, you know. The, there's a lot of competition for these. Aphids <laughs> being put in doom burst, the aphids doom burst. Yes, yeah. And if they like where they are, they dispense with sex. Mm. It's all parthenogenesis. They waste no time on sex, and they give babies to babies giving to, to, to babies that are giving babies. Right? Their strategy is only one strategy, multiplication, mm -hmm. you know? And if you have the proper diversity, that's your advantage. Because that, that multiplication is just food for your beneficials, mm -hmm. you know? And years ago, Richard said to me, Pat, remember, you're playing with fire. And last year sometime I thought, you know, remember him saying that? We do controlled burn burns all the time as humans. We play with fire all the time, you know? We're not afraid of fire, you know? And here, it's a matter of knowing when to strike. I know I can always come in with soap, now I know I can use neem, and in fact, I do have an aphid that drives me nuts. For all my bra braggadocio about aphids, right, and my, it's all taken care of, I got it figured out, right? The allium aphid, it's a black aphid, shows up on alliums. 
I think because the alliums are high in sulfur, nobody wants to eat it. And it is impossible when you get it, man. It just is horrible. If you see that black aphid on alliums, show no mercy, quarantine, soap, attack, 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 forget everything I told you. Go to war, <laughs> nuke it. Nuke it, nuke it, nuke it. Or cover with row cover and make ladybugs be in there. That'll work. But if they can leave, they'll go eat something else. If they can't get out, they'll eat on it. And I have ever bought pre-fed pre -fed lacewing larvae, which are probably one of the more voracious insects in the world. That's why they lay their eggs out on little stalks, because if they don't, the first one to hatch will eat all the other eggs. Mm. You know? And they will eat them, but nothing else will eat them. So there are exceptions to every rule. I make no guarantees. Observe. These are principles. That's what you want. You want the principles, not the guarantees. I can give you a guarantee, but that's not going to do you any good. You know? Okay, let's get a quick look in the garden and see what we can find.